Hi, I'm Dr. Sid, and you are watching Composure Under Fire. Hey, travelers, welcome back. I had the honor and privilege of interviewing Dr. Sydney Robinson about her experiences as a Fulbright Scholar. Travelers, if you're interested in this program, the Fulbright Scholar program, be sure to watch this video in its entirety. In this video, we talk about how to become a Fulbright Scholar and her experiences. But before we begin, make sure you smash the like button and smash the subscribe button for more content like this. All right, travelers, let's get started. Dr. Sid, what is your story? Well, hi, I am Dr. Sydney Robertson. I am from Dallas, Oak Cliff, Texas. My story is a journey of exploration. So I started out my academic career, my undergraduate academic career in the University of Missouri. And I, like many college students, had no idea what I wanted to do. So I was pivoting between multiple majors within the first two years of college until I landed upon textile and apparel management. Now, the key point of this story is that I didn't pick fashion merchandising or textile and apparel management because I particularly love the degree. I picked it because I love the advisor. I was searching for what I wanted to do, what I wanted to do, and I ended up meeting an advisor named Dr. Jamie Mestris, and she was so encouraging and so inspiring. I'm like, well, I don't know what you do, but whatever it is, I'm gonna follow that because I believe you and you believe in it so much and it seems like a great fit, so we just don't go this route. It ended up being the best decision of my life, so if I summarize my whole of my life, it's trust your gut and trust the people who give you good energy because it probably could lead you to the best opportunities possible. Because <laughs> that's kind of how this all started. Okay. Oh my gosh. So yeah, let's see. Um, I'm going to fast forward through life. I've had the internships. You know, I got through college. I got through my master's program, which was in public leadership at the University of North Texas at Dallas, where my mother is the director of the library there. So there was a wonderful research connection that I had firsthand access to. And where that is the ultimate research, but that's the ultimate connection. <laughs> like my mama literally is like, this is how you like search things specifically. And this is what database you use. I'm like, she's the best. So I did have an advantage. I will say that being an academic, um, both of my parents are super nerdy and super smart. So it wasn't odd that I took a path in academia. Like it kind of feels like the culmination of my ancestors are like, we are all building up to this type of moment for you. And even the children that come after you, there's going to be an extension that's even further than you. So I I just feel like we're all building blocks on each other. So let's see what else. I was keeping in touch with my former professors and former employers via LinkedIn. So if you do not have a LinkedIn account, I recommend getting one because it allows people to continuously see how you're progressing through life in a professional way. Because of my updated LinkedIn account, I got invited to do a a speaking engagement at my old alma mater, University of Missouri, to present to the current undergraduate students about my life, similar to what I'm doing now. After the presentation, my former advisor and former professors were like, oh my goodness, have you ever considered a career in academia? And I'm like, actually, no, but tell me more. So they said, well, you know, you could you would get a PhD, it would be fully funded, glory to God, and but you would trade your time if, for a teaching assistantship and a research assistantship and we prepare you for academia. My first mind was thinking, okay, I have a corporate job right now. Um, what's that gonna look like in terms of me paying for my bills? This is where God steps in. I definitely made less money than I ever made in those four years, but it never felt like it. Like, when I felt like I lived the richest life <laughs> in those four years on the brokest salary, <laughs> like I, it doesn't make sense. There's no logic behind it. It just happened that way, um, which also is an extension of trusting the faith and trusting the energy and trusting the vibe, whatever you want to call it, trust that, follow it and believe in it <laughs> and say yes to it and commit to it, which led me to El Salvador. So I'm trying to be concise. I'm going to backtrack and then move back forward. In undergraduate, during my undergraduate time, I actually had a experiential learning tour in El Salvador. That was the first time I went to the country. I was 20, 20 or 21 years old. And it was where I witnessed firsthand some of the not so pleasant experiences of clothing manufacturing. Um, got to witness people who were not necessarily being treated in the best of conditions. And it just didn't seem like a very joyful environment. And it touched my heart a bit. Jumping forward another seven years, I was able to apply for a Fulbright grant, Fulbright grant in El Salvador, researching these exact conditions that I witnessed seven years prior. Again, summarizing, if you feel like your life is a lot of random points in time that don't have any connecting dots, it's definitely not true. Like everything is connected 
if you find the way to say yes to the opportunities when they present themselves to you. Like, it's gonna make sense. And now I'm in Ohio. I have a postdoc in Ohio. So I graduated my PhD um, in four years and I got a postdoctoral grant or fellowship at The Ohio State University. And I'm currently both teaching and researching. I teach 20th century fashion history right now and it is a fabulous class. So if you my students see this, hey y'all, y'all are great, love y'all, hope you're doing your homework. Um, and I am still researching and wanting to publish from my dissertation. Um, but I'm also considering researching some other fun things and we can get into that in a while, but like, yeah, that's what I'm doing now. <laughs> wow, thank you so much for sharing your story. That, I love how it came full circle and I love how you trusted the process, you know, that you trusted God, you trusted, you know, that everything would be okay. Yeah, I mean, it definitely didn't feel like it. You know, you're going through the, I'm out of my twenties now, so I can, I really do look at that decade as a preparation period. Um, Cause a lot of stuff didn't feel like it made sense. You know, I was working in retail for multiple years and there was a point in time during my master's program where I was just working random part-time jobs because I didn't have a full-time career. Then I got back into another corporate full-time career and that wasn't really a good fit for me. So it felt like a lot of fumbling, but it was fumbling forward. <laughs> like I'm, I'm as long, I told someone, um, one of my other students a couple days ago, the worst thing you can do is not move. Like, it doesn't matter if you feel like you're moving in the wrong direction, life will course correct you. Like life will give you nudges to push you in the right direction, but the worst thing you can do is stand still in moving traffic. Like <laughs> pick a direction and go for it. <laughs> and figure it out along the way, just don't do nothing. So I think the best thing that ever happened to me was my choice to actively keep moving forward even when it didn't make sense. Did you ever think you would be where you are today? I'll say yes and no. I, I couldn't have imagined it, but it all, again, it makes sense now. Like now that I am in a, not just career path, but I really feel like I'm in my vocation. Like, I don't think that in any other life I would actively choose another profession because this one feels so good to me and makes so much sense to me. While I was going through my mental exploration of what I wanted to be and who I wanted to become, this was never an option. Like I never considered it. And you know, I'm, I'm in a college environment in undergrad I wasn't thinking, oh, I want to be a professor. <laughs> like that, that didn't hit me. Like, oh, I was thinking I wanted to be a buyer and like a fashion buyer because I'm in fashion merchandising, direct connect fashion buyer. And after I tried that, I'm like, eh, maybe not. Well, let's try the store management style because I love talking and working with people. I love service. I didn't really like that too much. And then I was like, well, maybe we'll just try a desk and corporate job. I didn't really like that. So I was like, you know what? <laughs> I'm, I feel more sure footed that my path is correct. But no, I don't think I ever at any point out before my PhD program realized that this is actually what I really wanted. Like I kind of just believed myself into it. But so yeah, I'm not surprised, but it also wasn't planned. Did you get pushed back when you, um, when you left your corporate job and you were deciding to like leave and go do your PhD? Yes, but from people that don't really matter. Um, and let me not say that. Let, you might, you know, let me say that, I meant that, I meant that, but let me add another 50% to it. I meant exactly what I said. It's not that the people don't matter, but sometimes you kind of, kind of almost have to expect opposition when you're going in the right direction. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like that was a <laughs> Like, I'm not, and I'm not even mad at the voices that were like, girl, like you ain't going, that ain't nothing. Like school is not a real career. You're gonna be wasting your time. Like all of the opposition is to be expected. And honestly, it's not personal. Like once I realized it wasn't personal that people were coming at me from their own positions of fear, like it didn't make me mad at them anymore. And it didn't make me feel like their their opinion weighed less in my consideration factor. So if I, I really do trust that gut feeling a lot in me, like if something is giving me peace, it's hard to ignore it. Like if I feel calm, why would I not go in that direction? Like if I'm in a place that's literally disturbing my like physiological makeup, like I'm sick every time I go here and like I'm miserable and I can feel my body deteriorating. Obviously, this is not the place for me. <laughs> but if I'm actively moving in a different direction, all of a sudden I start feeling the tension release from my neck and like I can breathe better. I'm like, obviously, like this is probably better. So I'm I, I'm grateful that you told me that it's not for you. That's great. Don't choose it. But it's for me. So. I'm going to choose it. Yeah, so I got pushed back, but not from any, I don't know, maybe the voices, they did, voices did matter, but seriously, someone was, <laughs> it's a quote, and I'm trying to think if I can actually say the quote out loud, but it's like, don't take constructive criticism from people who haven't constructed anything. Like if they haven't been down the path that you're trying to go, like really consider their opinion 
at a lesser value than the people who are already there. If I'm looking at the people that I'm inspired by and the people that motivate me, and these people are educators, and that's where I get my fire from, why would I not try it? What is a Fulbright Research Scholar? So a Fulbright Research Scholar, you could be someone who is has just completed your undergraduate career or going into a graduate career or a full-time academic. You are competing to be a part of a, or applying to be a part of a intercultural exchange program that could either be research-based or teaching-based. Personally, I chose the research option because I was in a PhD program, so that aligned more closely to my career goals. However, you could be a teaching assistant or have a teaching assistantship with Fulbright. It is a grant funded by the U.S. Department of Education, and it is also you are selected by the U.S. Embassy of the country that you chose where you wanted to study or where you wanted to teach. Most grants are between six and 12 months. I chose a 10-month grant. You earn a stipend. You have to write a proposal, either a teaching proposal or a research proposal. You go through rounds of interviews and preparation processes to learn how to be a best asset to the country of your choice, but also what is the mutual benefit of you going there? So <clears throat> with my particular grant, there were a lot of questions on the application about, well, we know that this could benefit you with your PhD re research, but how could this actually benefit the people of El Salvador? Like what value do you bring to our country that makes this a good exchange for everybody? And I studied women who worked in the apparel factories and my research was about getting their stories and their narratives about what they're going through, because you don't really see a lot of direct research on that. Um, you might see every now and again a documentary, but sometimes those documentaries aren't really telling you everything you want to hear. And a lot of times it's not published in research in a way that people are getting access to actually read it. So my goal was to bring out the narratives that this is what's happening and some stuff is great. Some stuff needs some improvement. How about we get the word direct from the women's mouth? Like, let's start at the source and work our way up. So yes, that was my research, but the Fulbright grant, long preparation process. Um, most people spend actually, you know, six months to a year actually I, going through the ideation process of deciding what they want to research and then connecting with mentors who can write their recommendation letters, finding a host institution, whether that's a university at that um, country that you're applying for, a museum, a library, a nonprofit organization, a company, like you have to find some direct connection while you're there because someone has to be responsible for you. Like someone has to vouch and vet for you, vet you to say, yes, we would like to welcome Chelsea as our research scholar or our teaching scholar. So it is a very, I wanna say, not necessarily strenuous, but challenging. Like, cause you have to be clear on what you want, but it's a beautiful process. I feel like I love meeting other Fulbrighters of color, which is super exciting. So when I was in El Salvador, there were four of us kind of coming in and out within the same year and a half time period. And three out of the four of us were women of color. Um, wow. Which I know, first of all, we were all women. <laughs> and then second, three out of four were women of color. So that alone provided, you know, an exceptional fun experience for all of us because we have something that we can connect to and relate to. And even that, you know, meeting people at the embassy, I met a girl in Guatemala. Hey, Lanita, how you doing, girl? You know, she works for the embassy over there and I was able to, you know, catch a bus to go see her and she was able to drive to come see me. So making those international connections with people who are at the same phase of life as you, around the same age with similar goals, you can't compare it. Like meeting another black girl in Guatemala while you in El Salvador an hour and a half away, like it's, it's priceless experience. <laughs> what is the application process like? Oh my goodness, long. I think my application was 25 or 26 pages. Wow. So <laughs> yeah, it was pretty intense. If I remember correctly, I had three recommendation letters. There is a personal statement and there is a research agenda or research statement. The personal statement is one page. The research statement slash research agenda is two pages, three recommendation letters, transcript. I had a language verification document. So my previous Spanish professor signed off that I was competent enough to speak the language in the country that I was going to. This is not a requirement. A lot of countries will permit you or a lot of Fulbrighties will permit you to have the grant, even if you don't speak the native language. Like, let's say you're going to like Bulgaria or like India or somewhere, like they're not expecting you to know Hindi. But it is helpful to have some type of 
reference or background or foundation. So even if you don't know the language per se, it would be very helpful if you took classes, like if you are in an academic environment and have some freedom to change around an elective, it would look really good on an application if you say, hey, I'm going to Brazil and I took a class in Portuguese to prepare me for this process. And even start like the, the year before, like the first time that you think that you're gonna apply for a Fulbright grant. First, think about the country that you wanna go to and why, but mostly think about how your research and or your teaching ties specifically to that country. Because one of the, con the questions they're gonna ask you is, so say, Chelsea, you wanna go to Brazil and study diplomacy, why Brazil? Like, can you not study diplomacy in Arizona? Can you not study diplomacy in Spain? Like what specifically about Brazil's diplomacy connects to your research? And you have to be able to sell that point very clearly. So for me with El Salvador, they're like, so, you know, there's textile manufacturing in India and there's textile manufacturing all over the world. Why specifically El Salvador? It's like, well, first of all, I already have relationships with this country, so I would not be building from scratch. But secondly, El Salvador produces more cotton goods and underwear garments in any other country in the Central American region. So I will be going to a source that has a lot of data and information that I could pull from. I wouldn't be searching for a needle in a haystack. Like there are literally factories lined up that make our socks and underwear and t-shirts and, you know, soft cotton and denim that I would have immediate access to um, because of the export value. So this is why I chose El Salvador. On top of the fact that I've been here at this point four times, I'm familiar with the language. I was a Spanish minor and I am competent. And I even took Spanish classes during my PhD program to kind of re-up on the information. So I feel like I would be a strong candidate for this country for those reasons. It sells your, it sells your point. So the process, we're talking about the, the application process. Usually if you're at a university, there is a research and development office or a grants and fellowships office. I would start there because they are going to know the rules about how to apply, when to apply, and getting your best chance. Usually you will go through, I think I went through like eight rounds of revisions of my application before it was actually submitted, which is normal. <laughs> you know, it's it, that's literally the life of an academic, to be honest, is revise and resubmit and revise and resubmit and revise and resubmit, and finally someone says yes. So don't get discouraged if you're on revision number five and they're like, nope, keep going. That's just a part of the, the process, like it'll be okay. Let's see here, what else did I have in my application? Of course, your transcripts, um, your proposal, so there, there's lots of space for you to almost repeat exactly what your research agenda is, but much of the initial parts of the application speak towards your ability to honestly survive in the country. So of course, the first is this one summary of like an abstract of what you want to do while you're, while you're there. But if I'm correct, the next question speaks towards how are you going to integrate yourself into the community of the country that you're living in? Like they want to make sure that they don't send you halfway across the world and you're freaking out. You've never had this food before. And all you want to do is go home and cry. Like that's a lot of investment. <laughs> so they're like, can you survive like halfway across the world and be okay? There's a lot of mental and psychological fortitude that goes into moving across the country, like, or out of the country. So there is some expectation that you can kind of psychologically handle yourself. Not saying that if you're not completely sound with that, there's not opportunities for you to find resources, but it would really be in your benefit if you're like, hey, well, I know that I struggle with anxiety in this way. Therefore, I have these measures in place to make sure that I am finding community and I'm making sure that I'm seeking those resources to help me that I could be the best possible scholar. But when you get onto the ground, or is there like a community already? Built? Oh, the, like, like in, on site, like in the country. Well, yes. Yeah, so when we first got there, the embassy hosted, in, you know, a welcome lunch for us and we got to meet the current Fulbright scholars. It was at that time it was three and then another girl was added later. But if I'm going to be honest, you kind of have to build it yourself, like get people's phone numbers and start a group text. Of course, there are foundations to start the relationships while you're on the ground, but it's up to you to maintain it. Like they're not going to force y'all to be friends. Uh, so I really did find a lot of my communal experiences on my own. So of course with the girls, you know, we would say, hey, you know, we're going out for the weekend. Do you want to go to the movies? You want to go to the beach? That was fun. 
but we honestly all lived with like within an hour and a half away from each other because El Salvador is not big but we just so happen to be on the other sides of the country so it took work for us to get together so the majority of the time I was by myself so I would go find the coffee shops like I would walk around and go to a coffee shop and make friends there or I would go to the local mall where there was only one mall in my small town in El Salvador so I would go to the mall <laughs> and kind of get to know like what type of stores were around I joined a belly dancing team because I needed to you know build some workout community I joined a CrossFit gym because that's something that I would do normally in the states anyway so I um, learned I took swimming lessons because I didn't know how to swim and I was slightly embarrassed like I'm 30 years old and don't know if I can survive in water so I probably should fix that uh, <laughs> so I actively started seeing my life this is a caveat but you know when you're a kid and you have like dance practice and piano lessons and like drama club like you're actively doing stuff all the time but something about when you become adult and post-college it's like you go to work you come home you go to work you come home it's like why do we stop exploration when we're an adult like why do we stop exposing ourselves to new activities that keep us both mentally and physically active so when i got to el salvador outside of just hanging out with the girls of course you had the embassy set us up with the lunch but after that it was up to us to maintain the connection i just pretended like i was in high school again like okay if i'm in high school like what would i probably be doing right now i probably be doing something that keeps me physically active okay well you know let's join a swim class or a dance team what do i do if i want to maintain you know sharpness in my mind oh well maybe i could make sure i'm sitting in on extra Spanish classes throughout the week. And I joined a local organization called um, Asociación Becarios de Estados Unidos. It was like the Association of Scholarship Earners who went to the United States, but they're in El Salvador. So basically scholarship earners who have gone to the U.S. but are Salvadoran and came back and they're trying to better their community. So, but me, so me in reverse, <laughs> but I joined their organization because that's something that I would naturally do anyway in the States. So finding those avenues of if I was at home, what would I be doing? Circling back to the application, what are some of the best tips for writing an application for Fulbright? Start early as possible, get it revised as much as possible. I would literally revise until like the last day, like, and don't get upset at the revision process. Like I have to tell myself that now as an academic, as I'm doing journal articles, because I get squeamish still too. Start early so that you can feel comfortably going through eight to 10 revisions and not being mad about it. You only refine it because of course your first draft, it looks good. But if you wait a while and you realize, oh, this word was unnecessary or this phrase is redundant or this isn't really answering the question, like keep going over it and always ask yourself, am I answering the question that is asked of me? I have a problem with that sometimes in verbal conversations, but <laughs> in writing, it really shows like it really shows if you're going off on a tangent on script. <laughs> and they're reading thousands of applications like they don't got time to be trying to find the answer to your question in the midst of two pages like it needs to be dead in their faces so i would say really work on finding concise ways to directly answer the question and build from there or if you're like me if you're a word vomiter get it all out and then slice and dice until you get to the root of the question because there might be a lot, like you might start off answering the question then go off in a narrative and then come back and then, you know, make a lot of loops. And finally you're like, and in conclusion, that's what I meant. <laughs> but in writing, you got to say, okay, that's not a part of the question. That's irrelevant. That didn't make any sense. Now we have a paragraph and that's actually what they wanted. And don't be afraid to use like bold and italicize, like to draw the eye to specific keywords and points. I feel like that really helped me in my application too. I'm really good at lists. So when I start feeling like I'm rambling, if I change my mindset to make it a list first, it makes me go point one, point two, point three, and now I know what I need to focus on and not get stuck in a narrative around point one, point two, and point three. So use bullet points, not a lot because it has to be a document, but like use italicized words, a couple bold words to draw the eye to a specific attention to a key phrase. It can really help. What is an average day like for a Fulbright research scholar? It's what you make it, man. So when I entered the Fulbright research process, the Spanish that I thought I knew was not the Spanish that I needed. <laughs> so the first three months of my journey were a headache. One, because we were in the middle of a pandemic and I'm in the middle of the world. Two, because the book learning Spanish is nothing compared to living it and being required to speak it every day with no option for another op choice. So you really are in control of your own time. It's up to you to kind of be the entrepreneur of your academic career at this point, your research career. Like you have to find the discipline to wake up 
today I'm doing quantitative analysis or today I'm doing pure literature review and research and finding the articles that best fit what I need. You have to make your own timeline. Having an advisor that is a, I have a, at that point, my dissertation advisor and department chair is a beast. Like when I say she's the most disciplined woman I know, like if I can be a third of who she is one day, I've done a darn good job. She's a linear thinker who really kept me on track with metrics that if I met them, then I was good to go. If I didn't meet them, sit you behind. <laughs> so it does take some finding some internal motivation. Being alone, I didn't realize was easy. It wasn't as easy as I thought it was gonna be because it's a different type of alone. Because again, you know, I got other peers, but they all an hour and a half away anyway. I'm in a country where the language, I know enough to be dangerous, but not enough to be comfortable. And I'm in a pandemic, so I'm isolated for a lot of time. That could have a mental toll, like it could take a mental toll on you, like it can get heavy. So as a Fulbrighter, your question was, what's a day in the life? I'll go to my typical bad day and I'll go to my best day and I'll go to my weekend day. A bad day as a Fulbright research grant were the days that I literally did not leave my room. I might've went to the office, I might've went downstairs to get food, but I went right back upstairs. Just because I, I mentally wasn't ready yet. Like one, the world was closed that I couldn't, I, did, I was on a campus where there were lots of security guards everywhere. So they were kind of watching my every move anyway. So I actually had to like sneak out and walk to a coffee shop and be like, <laughs> I got to find some other people. <laughs> like I'm stuck in here. But yeah, a bad day would me be giving into the fact that I don't know where I am. I don't know anybody and I don't know what to do with myself. So I'm just going to sit in here and watch Netflix and not move and maybe read a little bit, but I'm probably going to take a nap for like, or like three naps today the best day, my most productive days, waking up at five or six, I would go for a run around campus since, you know, they didn't let me leave for a while. So I was just like, hey, I'm gonna make the most of it. And I had this amazing hill that gave me the best legs that year. Like I lived on an uphill incline. So I would go running up and down that hill at five o'clock or six o'clock in the morning. Um, then I would get to the office and things really changed when they moved me out of an office that was literally by myself and there was nobody there. So I asked them if they could move me into the floor where other people were. Like, it was like a more of a cubicle style situation where you could see like seven or other people around you, but you kind of had your own enclosed desk environment. I asked if they could move me there so I could at least get the energy that there's activity somewhere around me to make me not feel isolated. That changed things for the better. Like, it took me three months to make that decision. Like, wait a minute, like, why am I literally a slug right now. Like, why do I feel heavy every day? Because I was by myself, like, like all day long. So by month four, I was working out in the mornings. Me, my Spanish started becoming a lot more fluent. And I was quicker with the words. I could think and dream and act and span. Like everything was flowing. I had the relationship with my house mom, Yesenia at that time. So she and I became friends. I would go into the office. I was able to have conversations with people. And then I met people who were like, oh, well, I actually go swimming in the mornings on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'm like, oh, well, maybe I can go with you. So then I joined a swimming class. Like it all just kind of built itself around me finding community and it made me more focused on my work. Some people can be in a hole and like just type away and really, really be productive. I learned that that's not me. Like I could be in a coffee shop and be more productive than I can be in my own bedroom or in my own, my own living room because the isolation is too heavy. Like, I need activity. A typical weekend for a Fulbright student, backtrack first. You're doing some type of research. It's either qualitative, quantitative, or like literary analysis. I was still giving conference presentations virtually in El Salvador. I was still grading student papers as a teaching assistant for the University of Missouri at that time. So I was still working. It was a, a balance. I was still tutoring too. So I actually tutored Spanish classes and I tutored textile classes for the athletes at the University of Missouri. So those, a lot of my evenings consisted of that. Fulbrighter on a weekend, exploration like crazy. Like I would literally Google, we, we, the girls and I had a bucket list, like El Salvador bucket list. Like, okay, we want to climb this volcano. We want to swim in this lake. We want to visit this nearby country. We want to like see the sites. So we had a bucket list of all the fun things that we could possibly do in that country and just like check it off like one by one. So I spent my weekends going down the country bucket list. Like, hey, well, I haven't climbed this mountain yet. So let's go do that. Oh, I haven't been on this excursion yet or I haven't done this yet. So that was what my weekends consisted of. Did anything surprise you about the program? Not really. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, I feel like I didn't have any expectations to be surprised by. It was kind of just like, hey, we going, like, let's, let's make this happen. I was very supported. Like I had the best support system. When I say when I arrived, there was people waiting to pick me up from the airport. Um, they made sure that my accommodations were ready when I got to the whole, my um, host university and the visiting professor housing. I literally 
needed and wanted for nothing. Like I was so well taken care of. So no, I don't think anything about the Fulbright program surprised me at all. It was very well ran. Everyone was very connected to my safety and I felt very well supported. I had contact with everyone that I needed to reach. Like no one left me high and dry. Um, I knew where everybody was. So it was it was a very well oiled machine. <laughs> What was the most intense part about being a Fulbright scholar and PhD student? I think, well, I can speak from an intellectual standpoint. Writing the dissertation is not easy. And writing a dissertation in another country definitely is not easy. I broke my laptop twice in El Salvador, so that was fun. <laughs> oh, like literally broke it. <laughs> and, you know, getting the process of getting it fixed. You know, if you break a laptop in the States, you can go to Apple real quick and they, you know, get another one. But in El Salvador, it literally took like months for them to find the screen and get it shipped from whatever other country was at to get it to me. So there was a lot of technological issues. So uh, what did you do in the meantime? Glory be to my host institution, the university I was at, Unikais. They connected the working part of my laptop up to monitors. Mm -hmm. So they had all these cables and cores. They were like, well, if you hook this up with this and hook this up with this, your memory is on this part. So we just gonna project it to this screen <laughs> and we made it do what it do. Like it worked. Struggling with getting through the process of writing a dissertation that is partly in a different language and still being an academic scholar away from people who can immediately help you. Like I can't just pop up on a library at the University of Missouri right now. I can't just pop in my advisor's office. Like I'm having to teach myself a lot of quantitative skills right now. And that was difficult. Honestly, being in a third world country, you, there are certain accommodations that we have here in the United States that just ain't happening for you. So I was killing geckos left and right. Like I was the gecko slayer, honey. And like, <laughs> you know, there was insects I ain't never seen before, but it, after some point it's just like, yeah, okay, you know, whatever, like move on. But first one's just like, oh my God, look at the bug. <laughs> And even animals, like the university I was at, it kind of looked like it, they had, there was a rainforest and they just cut out a middle of it and stuck a school there. So I was hearing all kinds of calamity at the night, like just animals like <laughs> doing God knows what. So getting used to that was a challenge. I got lost with one of my Fulbright friends in El Salvador one day in the middle of the night, like that was not fun. So I think a lot of it just has to do with conditioning yourself to another lifestyle, knowing that, yeah, you know, the food that you're used to eating, you ain't gonna find those flavors here. The gecko that's right next to you on your pillow, you might just have to flick it off and move on with your life. <laughs> you know, that statistics that you're trying to figure out, you still have to figure it out. You just have to, uh, you know, teach yourself right now and it's gonna be okay. And safety, like, you have to be hyper intentional about your own safety because what can happen is you go missing somewhere. So making sure people know who, where you are. I was frequently communicating with people that had my best interests at heart to make sure they knew if I was gonna be somewhere by myself, like, hey, this is where I'm at. What's next for you in the field? Girl, <laughs> writing, lots of writing, lots of teaching, publishing. I am challenging myself to not be a punk about publishing anymore. Because if I'm going to be perfectly honest, I still go through like writing fright, like, and like rejection fright. Sometimes I'm better at it, but I'm not going to tell you a tale. Like it's still a challenge to to believe everything that I told you that is easy. It's I'm not saying that it's easy because I don't believe it. It's still a growing process on the next level and next phase of life. So now I have complete set belief that. I'm where I'm supposed to be in life. I'm working on the belief that also I am an excellent writer and I'm an excellent researcher. So I'm going through that middle valley ground of, okay, you're gonna hunker down, you're gonna learn these hard skills, you're gonna learn these technical words, and you're gonna produce the fool out of this research, whether it's in written form, in documentary form, which is something that I really am looking forward to do sometime in my future. Like that is my big dream and I'm saying it to everybody I know just so 10 years from now, if you're like, she said it, it's, I said it. <laughs> That's what I want to do. But yes, what's next for me is becoming an excellent teacher and refining my teaching pedagogy in a way where students know what to expect when they take a class with Dr. Robertson and they're looking forward to it. And also refining my researching agenda so that when people read a paper, they can say, oh, I can see Sidney Robertson all over this. Like this is a Sidney Robertson paper or this is a Sidney Robertson production or fine tuning my agenda and identity as a researcher is what's next for me and making it a career in academia. So postdoc, assistant professor, getting up to full professor at some point. And at that point, we'll see. I don't know, girl, ask me. We'll see if I change my mind, but it'll have something to do with teaching. What was your favorite part about being a Fulbright scholar? Finding other Fulbright scholars that look like me. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the coolest. Like, it, it's just a cool experience. Like, I don't know. Like, when I, I didn't even know what a real Fulbright scholar was. 
I, it just sounded cool. Like, you know, it, when people's like, oh, I'm a Rhodes Scholar or I'm a blah, 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 whatever. It's like, yeah, okay, that's something important. But when you get to see like, oh no, people study and they research and they teach and they're internationally minded and they have global agendas and they're connected all over the world. And oh my gosh, she got box braids. Like, <laughs> it's, it's just such a cool experience. Um, so that's a big part of it. But also, I just love learning about other cultures. Like, it, it, there's nothing like being outside of your home environment and getting that type of world exposure to something that you know most people would never see. Like, it is a privilege. It is a full privilege that I got to do this. What would you say to someone who wants to follow your footsteps? Girl, pray. <laughs> pray. <laughs> no, for real. Like, pray and, oh my God, surround yourself with people that you admire. Like, take, a, take inventory of the people around you and realize, okay, I like where you're going. I like what you're doing. Would I want to trade places with you in any form of your life, whether that's your relationships, whether that's your career, anything? Like, I'm a firm believer in not, my mom says this too, this is another one of her best lessons, don't learn all the hard mistakes yourself. Like, really look at the direction that people are taking in their own lives. And if you like it, all right, you know, just kind of position yourself up under that and like kind of research what they've done and follow that. So I, my advice is do what I'm doing. <laughs> like, if you want to follow me, I'm following other people too. So we all just gonna be following each other at some point. <laughs> Seek the people that you admire and position yourself near them, whether virtually, whether through books. Like I admire Alice Walker. Like I admire Maya Angelou. Like I'm reading through some, I admire Eckhart Tolle. So I'm following a lot of that guidance. I admire my dissertation advisor. So I'm following a lot of her professional footsteps. Uh, my friends, like my friend group now is off the chain. Like it took some time to realize, you know what, people in my friend circle that are going a certain direction, I don't necessarily want the life that you're living. So why would I, why would I continue to hang out in the environments and do the things that we're doing if the outcome is not going the direction I want to go? It became a lot more serious again after 30, like 20s. I didn't really see the importance truly of it. You get it, but I didn't really get it. Over 30, I'm like, oh no, this is make a break. Like this is life or death. Like <laughs> it's, games are over. Like people are living, because think about this decade of your life when your 20s and your 30s, what you don't want to do is wake up 40 and 50, like damn, what happened? Like that's the, that is literally, if I had any fear, I want to know exactly how I got to what I did and I want the full accountability for it. I don't want to wake up 50 and be like, what did I do with my time? Like, what was I doing? Like, I want to know what I did and I want to know exactly how I got here. <laughs> it's because I was being intentional with not only who I was around, the inspiration that I allowed into my life. Like, I just deleted TikTok off my phone this morning because I was like, TikTok is literally wasting all my TikTok time. Like, I can't. Like, it's not <laughs> giving me, <laughs> it's not taking me where I want to go. <laughs> so it's got to go. Be decisive about how you spend your time, who you spend your time with, and the prayer time on top of it around it and underneath it. That's that's my advice. All right, so this is the rapid fire round. Whatever the first word is that comes to mind, just like say that, okay? Oh, okay. Your favorite location that you've been to? Jamaica. Your favorite food? Gumbo. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what is your greatest attribute? Optimism. When you are not working, what are you doing? Sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same thing. What are you reading? Oh, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens by Alice Walker. Mm -hmm. Who is your greatest ins inspiration? My mommy. Your first job? Summer camp counselor. What, are, what is something that you're most excited about? My future. Oh, okay. I like it. I like it. <laughs> what is your favorite sport? Track. Or favorite dance. Movie. Okay. Favorite. Uh, what is your favorite movie? Ooh. Dang. There is no rapid fire for this one. My brain, my Rolodex is like going crazy right now. <laughs> I love movies. Uh, next. I don't know. <laughs> I have to come back to that one. <laughs> if someone played you in a movie, who would it be? Oh man, I would love Journey Small to play me. Mm -hmm. I can see that. I can see that. <laughs>
All right, travelers, well, that concludes today's video. I want to say thank you to Dr. Sydney Robinson for spending time with us today and sharing her experiences about being a Fulbright Scholar. Travelers, if you're interested in being a Fulbright Scholar or any other travel careers, be sure to let me know in the comment section below so I can queue up the next interview. Until next time, travelers, let's travel with our dreams together. See you later. Bye-bye.